Society Library, this is our members' room, and a fellow of the Library of America. Imagine that. I mean, my, my two favorite things in New York are right here together tonight. I just want to welcome you all. We have a wonderful program. <clears throat> and I want to really quickly tell you my little story about Kurt Vonnegut. Many years ago, when I graduated from the University of Michigan with a degree in English, English. I figured, well, what do I want to do? I know, I'll be a book editor. So I went to the Radcliffe Publishing course up at Harvard for the summer. And at that course, they have a visiting author every summer. And so the director, Mrs. Diggory Venn, said, so now I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Kurt Vonnegut. Nobody had ever heard of this guy. He sort of shuffled up to the front of the room. And he said, I'm going to read to you from my slightly weird novel, Cat's Cradle. And it was just an amazing moment in history because he was so unknown. At any rate, we're all thrilled that you're here. I think it's going to be a wonderful program. And I would like to introduce you to Max Rudin, who is the publisher of the Library of America. Um, on behalf of Library of America, our president, Cheryl Hurley, and our directors and staff, uh, welcome, and thank you very much for our partner, uh, the New Society Library. For those who may not know, the Library of America is a nonprofit publisher and cultural institution dedicated to making permanently available authoritative volumes of great American writing. Our publishing program is supported by the Library of America Fellows, our patrons group, kind of our extended Library of America family. And it's terrific to see so many fellows in the audience tonight. Tonight, we celebrate two books, uh, volumes number 216 and, 200, and 226 in the Library of America series, edited by Sidney Offit, in which Kurt Vonnegut's dark, funny, eccentric, and wildly imaginative novels and stories take their place with the best American writing. Uh, as many of you, all of you, probably remember, uh, in the 60s and 70s, when Sidney got to know him very well, Vonnegut was a literary hero. His books helped set the tone for the counterculture, and dog-eared, uh, much-read paperback copies uh, were a regular feature of dorm rooms and jeans back pockets, like you all recall. Uh, his immediately recognizable style, a blend of science fiction, philosophical musings, and slapstick humor, fueled by a kind of world-weary moral fury, seemed so much to define and capture the temper of the era, seemed so much a part of that time, that it might have seemed surprising and unlikely that its magic would endure, and that we'd in fact be standing here today. But the work remains astonishingly vital. For one thing, uh, his subjects are still our subjects. The banalities of consumer culture, the triumph of technocracy, scientific irresponsibility, <laughs> environmental destruction. But more than that, it's clear now, clearer now than ever, that Vonnegut is a great comic moralist in the tradition of Mark Twain, <laughs> improvising fables that explore basic questions of human existence. Why are we here? How should we live? Does any of this make any sense? As with Twain, wild humor serves at the same time to mask and to reveal both outrage and despair. And, like his most famous character, Billy Pilgrim, Vonnegut's plots become unstuck from time and reality. They fly off to other eons and galaxies in a way that feels like a symptom of profound trauma, an imaginative response to war and horror and loss. These may be some of the reasons he still speaks to us. Uh, there's also that inimitable voice. Plain spoken, beautiful, funny, humane, is how Rick Moody describes it. He sounds like a person, Rick says, and a very warm, interesting person, not a literary voice. Vonnegut is, vi is vital, finally, because he's on the minds of vital contemporary novelists like Rick Moody, whose most recent novel, The Four Fingers of Death, is in important respects an homage to Vonnegut. We're extraordinarily fortunate tonight to have in conversation 
two men who bring different but complementary perspectives to Kurt Vonnegut. Sidney Offit, who knew him as a friend and working writer, and Rick Moody, who encountered his books as brilliant entertainments, inescapable influences, and inspirations to become a writer. Uh, I will turn things over now to Sidney Offit, um, an active and indispensable figure in the literary and civic life of our city, acclaimed writing teacher at NYU and the New School, curator of journalism's George Polk Awards, longtime board member of Penn and past president of the Authors Guild, author of two novels, 10 children's books, and two acclaimed memoirs, most recently, Friends, Writers, and Other Countrymen, uh, which includes anecdotes uh, of encounters with Eleanor Roosevelt and Che Guevara, Jackie Robinson and Jackie Onassis, uh, not to mention Kurt Vonnegut. <laughs> Please welcome literary raconteur extraordinaire, editor of the Definitive Library of America Vonnegut edition, Kurt Vonnegut's best friend and tennis partner, Sidney Alpha. <laughs> Sure, I'm not going to drop any names. <laughs> but I have to say that that was an absolutely inspired resume of Kurt Vonnegut's life, wasn't it? It, it could be kind of the encyclopedia. It's <laughs> beautifully done. It's a great honor to be here with Cheryl and Max as, as, as our host and to be able to sidekick with a young literary hero of mine, Rick Moody. And also, as I look around the room, I see my old friends Tom and Alice Fleming. And, over there in the far corner is Joel Canero, who once said to me, you should never speak in public unless you read a poem, because you should read a poem a day. Would you believe it? I am holding in my hand one of the very rare collections of Kurt Vonnegut's poetry. Kurt did call me his best friend. It amused me profoundly. And he used to send me a lot of stuff in the mail. I have to say to you in all, Honestly, I, I had no sense of celebrity with Kerr. I mean, I wasn't taking notes on the relationship. And the only reason why I save everything is because I save everything. I mean, I'm, just a, I'm 83 years old. If anybody wants a job, I mean, my wife would be relieved. I, mean, but I, I had this, this collection of poems when I thought about Joel's suggestion. I thought, I'm going to read you one to, to start. And then uh, maybe at the end, I may slip in another. Because one thing you know, if you if you're reading a Kurt Vonnegut poem, it ain't going to be Paradise Lost. <laughs> You'll be able to hear it. This is called Worship. I don't know about you, but I practice a disorganized religion. I belong to an unholy disorder. We call ourselves Our Lady of Perpetual Astonishment. <laughs> you may have seen us praying for love on sidewalks outside the better eating establishments in all kinds of weather. Blow us a kiss upon arriving at a party, and we will climax simultaneously. It became quite a scene, especially if it's raining cats and dogs. Well, there's a Vonnegut poem, and you heard it. <laughs> and it's one of this, this collection. And it, um, it is one of the aspects of Kurt that I, I suppose uh, many of you are aware of. He was an enormously diversely talented person. You're aware of that. He, in, uh, earlier this evening, a Charlie General was telling me about him signing books. He used to do little drawings of the books. And he, he really was an artist. He loved drawing. He loved, he loved art. He wrote plays. He greatly enjoyed writing poetry and short stories. And he brought to it that great diversity. I, I, I'm always fascinated uh, by the, the extraordinary, let's see, iconic figure he was to young people. As I look at all you young people out here, the ages of my children, I know. Because it was actually my, my son who introduced me to Kurt. I mean, not to him personally, but to his work. And I'll quote my younger son's line. To me, he said, uh, I think this book is the best book I've ever read. He said, Slaughterhouse Five. And I said, oh yeah, I know Kurt Vonnegut. And he said to me, I didn't ask if you knew him. I asked you if you read the book. Well, that put me in my place for the next uh, 50 years. <laughs> But I think that's, that is a, 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 a very valid way to start this evening's discussion. I'll tell stories and read excerpts from his letters, maybe, as we progress. But I think it would be just great to hear Rick Moody's uh, reflections on how he first became introduced to Kurt's work and, and how, how he played through his life. So I'm going to pass it on to Rick to kick that one around. OK, Rick? Thank you, Sydney. Um, I'm really happy to be here, too. Honored to be invited by the Library of America. Uh, 
And now I know I'm two degrees separated from Che Guevara. So, uh, I have to know they're still in that um, So, how did I come to be interested in Kurt Vonnegut? Um, I was trying to come up with an excerpt to read, and I reached intuitively for this book, whose jacket everyone will remember from the 70s, Breakfast of Champions. Um, it came out in 1973 when I was 12. And uh, I didn't actually get it that year, but I got it soon thereafter. And the way that I came to it is simply that I was a precocious reader like many eventual writers are. And I had spent sort of 11 and 12 reading from tip to stern every single word of Ernest Hemingway and all of Robert Heinlein, which is a really bad pairing of writers, but in a way, not an astonishing pairing for someone who then quickly moved on to devour every book by Kurt Vonnegut. So I came to Vonnegut because kids that I knew, the sort of um, bookish, chess prodigy, middle school type kids who read science fiction said to me, you should totally read this book, Slaughterhouse-Five. It's really incredible. And uh, I sort of dawdled on it a little bit. I think I may have polished off uh, The Lord of the Rings and the Interim and so on. And then my sister, I think, had this book, and I loved the jacket, you know? So I just figured I would wade in. Plus, it had pictures. <laughs> really incredible when you're 12 to have pictures. Um, so, uh, so I tried it out and uh, instantly devoured it without um, any hesitation at all. Um, and part of what was incredible, incredible to me was not only the sort of um, very counterculture feeling of handmade drawings and text, uh, but the incredible warmth of that voice. I mean. Max already read what I said about it, but that was really my reaction, that as a, as a sort of literary artifact, this voice was incredible, because it was like having a really wonderful person sort of whispering in your ear, and not in an elevated way, but in a way that was totally accessible to me as a reader at that age, you know? So that was really um, an important part of that discovery. And then the sort of odd mix of, um, realistic detail, Midwestern detail in this novel, and, you know, sci-fi weirdness um, came really easy to me. I mean, we now look back on a book like this and it actually seems sort of experimental, like an experimental uh, artifact of some kind. Um, but I think readers who came upon this work at first um, sort of drank it in as completely consonant with the kind of social weirdness of 1973 to begin with. So I didn't have any problems with uh, Midwestern locale plus Kilgore Trout and all that kind of craziness. It all sat together uh, nicely for me. And having finished this book, I then went and read, I think, six or seven of them right in a row. Well, you know, um, I, I have to say this because it, uh, yeah. Uh, it, it, Curtis, really, that, that sci-fi thing really drove him a little nuts. Did you know that? He wasn't crazy about being in, in, in one. In one of his books, he even mentioned the sci science fiction. It's like putting you in a drawer and wrapping you out. Because what it, what it, uh, the, the nuance of it is, is that you're not considered a serious literary figure. And I, I, I have to, I have to mention it. Stories. Uh, I went. We were once discussing that, and I said, Hey, Kurt, did you know I was an editor at the magazine of fantasy and science fiction? He said, doesn't surprise me, you seem to have done everything. He said, what were you doing there? I said, well, it's a good question. I said, you know, I was married in 1952, and my wife and I were discovering that I could make a living as a writer. That, that revelation came very slowly. But um, <laughs> I, I, I went to this job at, the, at L.A. Queen's Mystery Magazine, and the magazine is fantasy and science fiction. So he said, and, and what, what did you learn there? And that's a good question. <laughs> because it occurred long enough to me. I said, well, you know, uh, I, I, yeah, we had this long story, and we were supposed to cut it, and there was a, a gentleman named Anthony Boucher, who was the, uh, the uh, editor. We never saw him, but he was a very distinguished editor. You know, and he used to edit in, in absentia, but he used to write for the Times, and he was the authority. And then uh, 
I, I, I thought I had done the job. And I, I get back this cut manuscript, and there are five opening pages are missing. And they were the five pages that described how the spaceship went to Mars. Kurt loved that. He was so good to say, how did the spaceship get to Mars? He liked science. You know? I said, geez, Kurt, I don't remember anything from that. Not at all. Just that he cut it because he said, Boucher said, the important thing in a fantasy, science fantasy story, he said, you don't have to build a machine, just have them land on Mars. And then he got off one of those real shots they got. He said, the, the line that the reader is most willing to accept is the first line of the story. Yeah. And Kurt took another puff and said, well, you learned something. <laughs> <laughs> I, I never brought it up again, but it did have that feeling. I, I, I was just, uh, because Rick is such a wide-ranging stylist, I'm sure most of you have read his book, but I, I'm just curious to know, Rick, how do you feel about science fiction? Do you, do you feel as if it's a, a genre that should be dismissed? Do you think it's fair to call Kurt that kind of writer? How do, how do you I mean, I totally can understand why he would want to avoid being ghettoized as a science fiction writer, because it is a sort of a, a kind of backwater from which it's hard to transition into being a literary writer. And he really dramatized that with Kilgore Trout. I mean, I think Kilgore Trout, who was the sort of um, woe-begone woe science fiction writer in several Vonnegut novels, himself was trying to find a way out of that spot, trying to write his way out without success. And, and uh, so I totally understand why he would resist that. And I think it would be, you know, completely inadequate from this vantage point to consign Kurt to that spot in any way. Um, but that said, I don't actually believe that genres exist in some fundamental way. I think it's just a bookstore thing. I don't think. I, I, I don't I, think. Do you all hear that? Because I think that's right. The, the, the genre <laughs> is not that really important. Yeah, I mean, um, it's just a way for sort of people somewhere to kind of have fun splitting hairs about what particular kinds of books are. So the real difference is between literary writing and writing that's not particularly literary, and I associate literary writing with emotional complexity and. Um, ambition of a certain kind. And it would be easy if you were just a completely superficial reader to think that Kurt was just about warmth and a certain kind of humor or something, and to miss the absolute emotional complexity and literary ambition of his intention, which does rely on Twain, as Max said, and on a sort of American tradition that includes Thurber, perhaps, or Dorothy Parker, you know, writers with great wit, but um, but I feel like there's real novelistic intention in, in Kurt's work and emotional range, and so on that basis, there's no reason at all to consider him a quote unquote genre writer that would be limiting. Well, I think that's as definitive as you get. I, I'm going to add just a footnote. Uh, I was always a little self-conscious about this. So I'll share it. Kurt. Said, said, I think he wrote it, so I, I, I know it's valid. He thought that one of the reasons why uh, literary people tended to, to be dismissive about science fiction is because often people who were literary, very literary, their impulses and tastes, weren't too good at the sciences. I mean, I don't know, we're not going to take a vote. But, uh, I, mean, I, I understood that. I mean, I, you know, the, I remember you know, at Johns Hopkins, where I was an undergraduate, they, the pre-meds were the demons of the school because everybody was going for the and the English majors were not messing around with biology and physics. And physics, I later learned. I made a very wise marriage and married a woman who was five <clears throat> summa cum laude who could study everything. And uh, so our sons, one of our sons, did study physics for a while. And I, I understood that there was a, a, a vast dimension of revelation in life, almost religious in that dimension. And Kurt had that. Kurt had that dimension of perceiving and responding to science. And um, I just mentioned that in a passing comment. Uh, there's, one, there's one other, it's, it's incoherent, but that's what makes good discussion. Um, the, the other observation was he was very observant, observing of everything around him. And I'll give you this one to go home with. How rarely do you look up at what you're passing by? I mean, look up at buildings. I mean, I'm honest with you. I really didn't do that very much. You know, I mean, 
And whenever I walked with Kurt, he would be looking up. And the, I, I, I got it in my, in my pocket, because there was one day we were walking up 57th Street. You can test this one. It was across 57th Street, across Fifth Avenue. We, we walked by um, Tiffany's, and the building right east of Tiffany's, and he looked up and said, would you guess what that, that was once a public school? And it, there it was, PS, you know, five numbers and four words like on it, boom, boom, boom. And uh, uh, every time I, you know, every time, I, I, from, from many times when I'm walking by that, that I look up and say, thank you, because in spite of it, it is a whole dimension, and it's an aspect of the, of the literary craft that, that I think he definitely brought to it. I'm going to move to a, uh, another, um, uh, just observation of his, and to share and see what Rick thinks of this one. But this is Kurt, uh, and a special message to, to readers in relationship to that, the, the, the Slaughterhouse Five. And if you have never heard this before, it, it's worth being here tonight just to get this. This is Kurt Vonnegut on the Dresden bombing. It's a, it's a brief piece. I'm just going to read you four lines. He said. Atrocities celebrate meaninglessness. I didn't mount the stage, I went home. I was his line on Dresden, and here it comes. The Dresden atrocity, tremendously expensive and meticulously planned, was so meaningless, finally, that only one person on the entire planet got any benefit from it. I am that person. I wrote this book which earned a lot of money for me and made my reputation such as it is. One way or another, I got two or three dollars for every person killed. Some business I'm in. Well, that's a stinger. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll drop that one old, old Rick. Where are you making that one? Oh my God. <laughs> you know that? Is, that, is that a lot? Okay, good. What's your reflection? Wow, we could talk all night about that. <laughs> I mean, I have such complicated feelings about the Dresden image as it plays out in Vonnegut's work, I think. I mean, I think it's utterly central to what he does. I'm sure you would say the same thing, that all the books come from that moment in some way, that, that the moment that Slaughterhouse, was, Slaughterhouse Five was conceived, that as its centerpiece, with that as its trauma, if you will. Um, Vonnegut locked into the thing that made him especially great, and he never really looked back from that moment, which is not to say that some of the work before that isn't, isn't great, because it is. But from that moment on, he's an absolutely major American writer. And um, we could sit here all night talking about Dresden itself and whether or not that was a wise move or whether the military effort required Dresden in order to be completed or what have you. But I think what, what makes it especially useful for readers of Vonnegut is just the fact that there are human faces there and, um, and that the situation in which he found himself, you know, as a sort of, um, friendly fire casualty or near, nearly one since he was part of the Allied forces and nonetheless found himself there at that moment um, is incredibly curious and, and as I was saying before, kind of emotionally paradoxical. But its primary value for me as a reader is just in the fact that a human face has been attached to a great atrocity. And that's as it should always be in literature. That's I think. beautiful. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to move it around again. Uh, uh, Kurt and I, I were friends. We just spent a lot of time discussing literature. But, but Tom Fleming and I don't even need to Joe Carter. You don't really bat around and talk about life and things. And so I only brought it up once when I was teaching at, at the new school. And this was so long ago, I can't remember what decade was. And I was going to miss a class. And I, I, I went to military school, so secondary school, so I have a great sense of duty. And I said, Mr. Vonnegut, I'm about to impose on you. I said, I, I have to miss a class. Do you think you could cover it for me? <laughs> he was always pleased by my memories and multi-characterizations. <laughs> he smoked a cigarette and exhaled and said, it's possible. I said, well, okay. Um, 
I'm going to announce it to the class. I'm just curious, Kurt, because you have such an individual style. And this this was during an era that was so long ago that the, the, the mimicries of, of style that I would see in class with, with Salinger was still in, you know, uh, when I say mimic, I don't think that the student who was writing that, that often wasn't realizing that this is a, an imitation and you're not going to go for it. And occasionally you'd see a play at Monica, but nobody who, who played at it went it through. It was too tough to sustain. So I was curious as to how he, he would teach writing. I said, how do you do? And he, and he taught, I think he was either on his way from to Iowa or something. And he said, well, the major thing you, you, you teach, he said, is development. And teach development. I said, yeah, and he did a chart. I didn't bring that, but it was a great chart. It was written all over the place. And uh, I made the big mistake of announcing to the writing class that I was going to miss the session and Kurt Vonnegut was going to be there. Uh, I, I asked a friend about it earlier, can you guess the first question? I said, can we bring a guest? <laughs> said, can we bring two guests? How many guests can we bring? Said, oh, Jesus. And I was in a cold sweat. I knew I had mistake. You know, the last thing you want to do is exploit your friend. I, remember that. I said, well, um, and, and I'm not good at this. That's my weakness. I don't like to hurt people's feelings. You know? And so I said, well, okay. Um, yeah, but uh, I'll leave it to your discretion. <laughs> so I thought the only thing I could do was cancel the, the trip I have to and go with him. I, mean, I just couldn't let the guy. But you know what happened. You walked into the hall. You couldn't get to the room. And you know, this guy, he was so enormously modest. I mean, he didn't even pick up the celebrity aspect of it. He made it, I was the star. I mean, he, he already could write, I said, no, this is not my place. He was all your fans that are coming out. He said, no, no, he said, you're there, love you again. And then uh, it made me very conscious of, of his, uh, and he, he spoke, we, we cut it up together, but he spoke a little bit about the craft of writing with detail. And then I later, in, in, in reading for this, uh, for the Library of America, came across this, this description of the craft of writing, which I'm going to share with, with Rick, because I'd love to know your responses. This is unfair to spring it on him, but there, he had 10 rules, and I'll read them to you. This is, this is Kurt Vonnegut. He begins with, now lend me your ears. Here is Creative Writing 101. One, use the time of a total stranger in such a way that he or she will not feel the time was wasted. Give the reader to give the reader at least one character he or she can root for. Three, every character should want something, even if it's only a glass of water. Rule four, every sentence must do one of two things, reveal character or advance the action. Rule five, start as close to the end of the story as possible. Rule six, this one is a stinger. Be a sadist. No matter how sweet and innocent your leading character, make awful things happen to them in order that the reader may set, see what they are made of. Oh. Testing the character. Whew. Seven, write to please just one person. If you open a window and you make love to the world, so to speak, your story will get in a moment. And then the final rule is give your reader as much information as possible as soon as possible. The heck with suspense. Readers should have such complete understanding of what is going on, where and whether they can finish the story themselves. Should cockroaches eat the last few pages, they know where it's going. Now, that is a tough one. But you got a little speculation on this? I don't know. Uh, let me see that. <laughs> I didn't make that up. It's kind of startling, isn't it? I mean, the, um, I, I tried it once in a writing class, and I, the, the line that got me was, be a sadist. You know, I took, I, 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 that, that just, that well, was, there, this list. there's like, two things that I like about this list, which is, in the main, totally unimpeachable good advice. But, uh, but there are two things that interest me. One is number seven, right to please just one person, yeah, which yeah. is incredible and really important. And it's the thing I say to, to my students all the time now, I say, do not write for the market, don't think about the market, only the practice is important, not the results of the practice. So if you make the work every day and work at it every day, that'll be result enough, but that level of commitment is usually followed by some felicitous outcome. So I totally agree with them about that. Who would you say is the one person you write for? Could you say that? 
Rick Moody? Yeah. Oh, I know him. <laughs> um, but the other thing that's really moving to me, and I read this in, in your introduction to the, um, Look at the to, yeah, to the posthumous stories, um, is how committed he was to narrative, you know? And if we were to sort of go back and think about Vonnegut novels, Slaughterhouse-Five is completely circular and revolves around the Dresden image, you know, the way a tornado revolves around the cow that it's sort of kicking through the air. Um, uh, so it's in no way a linear narrative and could not be considered a linear narrative. Breakfast champion of champions, uh, the protagonist is bipolar or something, at least very mentally ill, and um, and it lurches back and forth between him and Kilgore Trout until Vonnegut himself appears in the narrative, which is the passage I want to read a little later. Um, so, on what basis is he saying push the narrative forward? Uh, by the time we get to the 70s, the American novel has has uh, fragmentation as part of its process. And Kurt lived through that period, and he had something to do with that period. He engendered part of that period. But I think at the same time as that's the case, there's a, a very archetypal storyteller at work in his writing, and, uh, and he's keenly aware of the sense of time passing and, uh, and the kinds of um, humilities that go along with time passing. So things happen, people change, they get wiser, they go through the travails of life in Kurt Vonnegut, even when you have these incredibly slippery, um, episodic or strange superstructures. All right, here's a dirty trick. This is a Rick Moody novel, okay? That is a dirty and, trick. I, 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 I want to just share this, because I thought that this, that this particularly the description, chapter 66, the description of the house, has a, a, such a rich texture to it that it, it, it had a that kind of, well, I'll give you the specific. Uh, John Leonard, at, at Kurt's 80th birthday, talked about his style, and he said that the, he was like a, a, a Mark Twain, and he said Abraham Lincoln, I, for some reason. He said because uh, when they were not depressed, they were humorous, he said, and they, their writing was like jujitsu. They would flip you at the end of the sentence and stun you. This is Rick Moody, and I, I, he's, he, he's the first person there. I'm not setting it up because it'll take you long, but it's a description of a place. I'm talking on a dial phone, an old dial phone, five pounds worth, and the kitchen is bigger than my entire apartment. You could park trucks in here or feed an army, and the refrigerator, one of those enormous serial killer refrigerators, you wouldn't even have to cut off the arms, just go ahead and throw victims in hold. The house is so big, I got lost coming downstairs to make tea. I don't know where I ended up. There's a living room the size of a tennis court, a library just as enormous, except it all looks like they got bored with home improvements back around disco. It goes on. Now, do you get it? I mean, it's got that little to the thing at the end. So I'll tell them, where does this come from? Uh, do, do you find that something coherent with the perceptions of You know, I read that quote before, and I, I got confused by the jujitsu part of it right, for right. some reason. But I totally agree with the comic and tragic being adjacent to one another. And I think that's totally central to Kurt's writing. And it's certainly something that I understood even as a teenager when I was reading this work. And I, I think my personal idea of novel writing is the funny stuff is funnier if there's some sad stuff right next door to it and vice versa. In other words, there's a dreadful earnestness to some of American naturalist writing um, because it's completely leached of anything funny. You know? I was reading uh, Flannery O'Connor this week at NYU for my class. Flannery O'Connor is so devastating because she's so funny in spots, you know? And, uh, and Kurt is sort of the absolute model for that kind of thing. It's exactly the funniest moments that are the most sad and vice versa, you know? It's a really important lesson because great literary writing to me 
has to have all those tonal colors. It's like a symphony. You can't have a symphony if you don't have, you know, different tempos. That's part of symphonic structure, you know. And it's the same with a novel. You have to work out each way and prove that you can do the tragic and the sad in order for all of human emotions to be packed into one book. This kid has just knocked it right out of the park. He's absolutely, I don't think you know this. Kurt introduced me to Flannery O'Connor's work. Did you know that? He was a great admirer of Flannery O'Connor. A good man is hard to find. Remember the end of that tour? I remember him, because he, he, would, he would understate it. He said, you've got to read this. He pushed the, <laughs> the book towards it, smoked a cigarette, and then we kept moving. And when, he, he thought Flannery O'Connor was one of the great American writers. It's, it's just a, as an observation, and so your, your reference is absolutely right, right on the button. I, I just, um, I just want to share a couple of experiences of that matter because the literary quality of this has been pretty well defined already, and I'm just and the personality of somebody that um, I don't think too many of us got to know Kurt that well. I, I didn't know that at the time. I thought that he, he was conspicuously. I mean, one of the qualities that Kurt had is that he could he couldn't say something he didn't believe. But by the way, that's a fascinating quality. I'm married to a shrink, and we discuss that. Because you know? <laughs> I can, you know. She can, and it's interesting. For example, it, it can be as elementary as going to visit somebody in the hospital room and say, you look fine, yeah, you look good, Charlie. Yeah, yeah. And somebody would just, Kurt would just nod his head, and maybe leave the room. He just couldn't say something, which is very, it, it's a marvelously paradoxical aspect of a person with such extraordinary imagination, you know. That's that straightforward manner about everything that he saw and everything he encountered, and uh, it was, he, he, did, he did not like confrontation at all. So he, he sort of steered from that. But one of the things that he really had great, great delight in was sport. And uh, he and I played tennis together and ping pong. I've got to tell you the ping pong story because it's, it's, it's probably my, one of my two or three classic moments. We were playing ping pong, and I don't know they call it table tennis, but we call it ping pong. And um, it wasn't easy to find a place. We found this place on Broadway, and we used to go up there and play. play and we, we actually played so often enough that we bought paddles and left the paddles there. And the guy who, who, who kept the paddles had no reason. And I was on Channel 5 at that time. You know, so, so people would recognize me. Over, so we, but we both walked in like it was a speakeasy hideaway. There wasn't was anybody else but us. And the guy would look at us and say, here, got your paddles. Total monotone. It's going to be five dollars. I think you're playing a little longer. You want the table on the lap? Uh, how many ping pong balls do you want today? What do you say, sir? How many ping pong balls do you want? I said, we better give us a So that was that was the relationship, and really social, booming through the room. So we were playing, and Kurt came up with the first fun to get in position. He said, let's let's play a hundred point game. I said, okay, I said, well, what's the reason? He said, we always wind up with three or four points between us, so let's go for 100. We don't have to keep so much math for sort of thing. So we were playing that 100-point game on a day when two young guys came in and took the, court, uh, the, the table to our right. And they were playing, we were playing the hardest part of ping pong for us in those days. We were just at that point where bending down to pick up the ball was getting a little difficult. <laughs> and out of love for him, because he was very tall, I would pick up the ball more often. I think he's, he's got further to go. So, so the, ball, the ball goes flying, and the, the guy with the three balls had me all confused that day. I only took two and couldn't find one, so we we're down to our last ping pong ball. And the ball goes across the room, and this kid picks it up. And I, 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 and I, I walk over and I say, uh, uh, grab on. He says, yeah. He says, aren't you the guy on Channel 5 television? I said, he said, don't they call you professor? I said, he said so, so why are you playing a 100-point ping pong game? And I said, well, actually, it's not my idea. I said, it's my friend Kurt Vonnegut. He said, who's it? And he said, that's Kurt Vonnegut. And the other guy comes over and says, that's Kurt Vonnegut. Like they're telling each other. And I said, yeah, that's Kurt Vonnegut. And Kurt's there, very quiet, doesn't have a cigarette because he's playing sports. And he's standing with a nod, head, and then, then the kid says, Mr. Vonnegut, could, could you could you autograph this ping pong ball for me? <laughs> It was a dramatic moment, because it's going to be the end of our day. The guy says, okay, he puts out a cave. Somewhere in the world, there's a guy with a Kurt Vonnegut team. And we wrapped it up. I don't remember the score of the game, but that was the end of it. He said, well, there we go. That, that was, I thought it was, I'll I tell, I tell you one other one that I, I, that I love. Is that, I, my wife has written books about sex, and, 
uh, her first book, uh, The Sexual Self, was a huge success. It sent our kids to school and all. And uh, <laughs> Kurt, Kurt would always say to me, uh, you get teased about that? He said, be sure to tell people she learned everything she knows from you. <laughs> you know, I could never get that out. Right? It just didn't seem you know, appropriate. It wasn't true. So it was, uh, but the, uh, we, we both, the, the, I'm tucking in on my confidence here. You know? Uh, we both agreed that we were fascinated by pornography. This is a literary organization, and I can tell the truth. And neither one of us had had the daring to go to pornographic movies. And they were, do you remember that era? They were all over the joint. And then that, that guy made that movie, Caligula, I think it was called, right? And it, it was playing in town. I, you know everybody looks very interested in this. Look at the changes in the <laughs> Kurt and I said, you know, uh, I said, your wife's a sex there, you can go. It's just long you're doing research. I said, yeah, you're coming along as my friend. So the two of us decided we're going to see the we were right. We were right. <laughs> we walked, we were right. As a matter of fact, that movie was not an off off Broadway. It was right, it was right around Lexington Avenue. We walked in and we go to the movie and we're watching. I, I mean, I feel like the most sinful man in the history of the world. I mean, my sexuality is going 40,000 different directions. And I, 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 I don't know, I'll spend the rest of my life in this movie theater. You got me. And I, the movie goes on for about 20 minutes, and then Kirk gets up and walks out. And I get up and walk out, you know, looking over my shoulder right behind me. Then when we get right in front of the theater, he gets off one of those great jujitsu lines. He says, too much of a good thing. <laughs> I love it. Too much of a good thing. That took care of that. That took care of that one. That was the end of that afternoon. I said, you've got two of my good stories. I, 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 uh, I think at this point, we, what's that? I think it's time that we should open for questions, right? If there's any, any questions you, you, you want to share with us, we'd be delighted. Or any observations, we'd make it even broader. Yes, Mr. Thomas Fleming. You all know the distinguished novelist. I always wondered about Kurt. I'd love to hear your opinion. Does it, do you think that coming from the Midwest has something to do with his directness? And this is right. Sort of basic and explicit. Yeah, you, you're you're a great, let, let's even take the first shot at that because you're yeah. the first. Wow. I mean, I was going to say something about that actually if I got a chance because it seems so transparent to me. Absolutely, yes, that there's a kind of fundamental Midwesternness to the tone and to the yeah, lack of artifice. Sense, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, like, I love it. You know? Yeah, yeah. It, which is so different because, well, it's different from a lot of writing that's generated in the East and West Coast areas, you know. So there's a real decency, politeness, uh, and directness about the voice. I think that's totally central to what he's doing. Uh, that's absolutely, he, he said so himself. I mean, he, Kurt, Kurt always said that. I mean, he, he felt he was a Midwestern and this was all just part of the great adventure of New York. New York was, um, I'm, I'm from Baltimore. We, we call it Baltimore. But, uh, uh, not Baltimore, but Baltimore. And I, I felt the same, I understood that feeling, but not, we, we discussed that. So you're right on the button at that time. Uh, and, and we decided that Baltimore was not com comparable to the Midwest. The culture of Baltimore was not that different from that story. And what, what I had not known, I don't know if I've got this right, but uh, at one point, I I, sorry, I read, either heard, and I mentioned it to Kurt, that, that, the, 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 uh, the, that the largest number of immigrants in this country were from Germany, that there were more German immigrants. Is that true? And, that, 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 and that the Midwest, and that what was startling is how many people from Baltimore, New York, that I knew I had no awareness of that. You know, and this is even, this is going back through World War II. We knew there was a boom and there was rats coming, but we didn't know the numbers were that overwhelming. It was a very rich culture, and I think he totally did a dead spot with that. Okay, good question. Anybody else have an observation or question you want to share with us? You're totally intimidated by that thing? Yeah, it's always the first one that's really hard to get through. <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll give you a one, uh, one, one more reflection on the sports, and because I think this, this is a letter. Am I sharing everything with you? This is a, this is a Kurt Vonnegut letter to, to me in uh, 1981, and it says, Dear Sydney, I, I really miss you and all the other tennis pals. I'm like Flexner. And I, I had to read this because Jimmy Flexner was the person who introduced me to this, you know, this library years ago. And I mean, Jimmy, I'm going to make an observation. 
I don't know many of you knew him. He was a great American star that were about Washington. And, uh, and, 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 and also, he, he, he also wrote about his family in American art. And when Jimmy when he was no longer at the, at the Frederick Lewis Allen room, he came here, invited me here once, and he had that marvelous way of speaking with a flick of his hand. You know, so it's a charming place. He said, there's great resources. You may like it here. <laughs> and he, I didn't know if he was inviting me to join, but we were showing off. You know, I was in a total state of boredom. And then he had one of those great flex. I said, but then again, you write novels. This might that interest you. <laughs> that was my experience until today. But with Jimmy, when we played with Kurt, Jimmy and I had been playing for years together. And we had Harry J. Lyon and a couple other people. And then he, Jimmy Fletcher, the greatest story that we made, he had no awareness of Kurt Vonnegut, except that his daughter told him. She, she was awed. You're playing tennis with Kurt Vonnegut. And Kurt was just not playing, and he adored Jimmy. And Jimmy kept calling Kurt my friend. He would say, your friend, Kurt Vonnegut. It was never Kurt Vonnegut. Your friend, Kurt Vonnegut. It was like, you're responsible for this man. And it was OK, because he was my partner a lot, and we won. But that was his friend. Jimmy wasn't a demon player either. But Kurt loved that group. And in this letter indicates the bonding that took place over all the years. But he goes on to say, I'm like Flexner. You guys are the only friends I have. Now, there's not a start. I mean, the literary friends were not He said, I'm beginning to wonder if my arm will quit hurting and get strong again the way the sports medicine doctor said it would. You went through the same thing, did you? We all were playing, we weren't that old, I guess we're in our 60s, but like, like 50, 60s, the 60s, early 70s, but we were all cracking her up. And then he, then he, then he, he has a reflection here, which, which is off the track of this, and it is a confidence, so don't talk about it, even though you taped it. There was a former writing student of mine whose name was Steve Kunis, who had published a piece, and it was in People magazine, that he and his friend, named James uh, uh, J. J. Salinger, had written him a letter, and they were writing a piece about it. And I, I showed Kurt the letter. Do any of you remember it was a scandal? You do remember it. It was a scandal at the time. And uh, I, I, I had no involvement except that this guy, Kunis, was my student. And, and he, I, he wanted me to get Kurt to verify that. And the, what, what do we know about the style? But the, I, I did it the confession from Kunis, but that's another story. But he refers to it here. He said, it's, 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 the Kunis piece seems genuine and even illuminating. See, he, he, it was a sucker punch. This guy was a great mimic of stylist, the kid. Right. He said, I was the person, incidentally, who asked J.D. Salinger to sign cash for the rye and who was refused most angrily. Did you ever tell Kunitz that? Did you know that, that, that Salinger wouldn't sign books? And that this, this, he said, I used Salinger's neighbor, the centurion Frank Platt, to sign the book for its wonderful Russian translator, Rita Ray. Salinger not only refused to sign the book, he stopped speaking to Platt. <laughs> <laughs> so those of you who are writing a biography of J.D. Salinger, I'm sure you mentioned this in the footnote. Oh, God. Oh, God. I must have told you during our ping pong days so long ago, the Truman Capote said that Salinger had submitted stories regularly to the New Yorker, and that the stories which Capote claims to have read are awful. I asked, have you gotten enough names for your afternoon here? Can I get one more name, and the quote is over? OK. I asked John Updike if he believed this, and Updike said he wouldn't surprise if it were true that Salinger was certainly trending towards incomprehensibility. Yeah. Updike explained over the early stories, saying that they were so juicy. This was a way of suggesting, I think, that Salinger didn't have much of an intellect. Finally, I guess, you can't, you can't make a career of simply looking. Sooner or later, if you're going to go on writing, you have to put some hard-edged ideas in your mind and believe them the way you believe in Tinkerbell. Seasons, uh -huh. greetings, and love, Kurt Vonnegut. That's the last of my confessions. I don't know. Is everybody else? Can we wrap it or do you want to ask anything else? Satisfied? Shall I read the last poem? I'm going, to, I'm, go for I'm going to just read the last poem, very brief, and then this is another Vonnegut, and you can go home, you have two Vonnegut poems, and, yeah, and you met Rick Moody. Okay, this is called <laughs> Intelligent. All right, I'll pick that up here. What's that? All right, I'll pick it up at the end. Okay, this is on. I know that's what you wanted to read. No, 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 I've got it right here. This is, this is very brief. This is, this is a Vonnegut, four-liner. It's called Intelligent Design. 
Evolution knows exactly what it is doing and why. That's how come we've got giraffes and the clap. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Thank you.